projectile motion problems. Uh, some examples of projectile motion problems would be like dropping something off of a cliff or chucking something straight up in the air or variations of launching something at an angle. But no matter which variation you get, as long as you're dealing with a projectile motion problem, it is just basically a subset of constant acceleration problems uh, in dynamics. So for the first two examples like here where we just have vertical motion, the constant acceleration here is the acceleration due to gravity which is negative 9.81 per second squared if we consider the positive y direction to be up. And in problems that involve uh, a horizontal aspect of the projectile motion, um, we just treat it separately, like uh, we break the problem into two parts where we treat the vertical motion with the vertical acceleration as negative 9.81 meters per second squared, and then we treat the horizontal acceleration as a constant as well, which is just going to be 0 meters per second squared because once the object has been launched, it's not like it has um, an engine on it or something that's propelling it and accelerating it, it's just being launched and it's just flying through the air. And these problems are always, uh, at this level, are always going to ignore the effects of air resistance. Um, so it's, uh, it's not slowing down due to air resistance, we just consider it to have zero meters per second acceleration in the x direction. Uh, but when we look at both of these, negative 9.81 or zero, both of these are constant values. They're not changing with distance or time or anything like that. And that actually makes things pretty easy for us because the acceleration, uh, if we have constant acceleration, then we can say that this is just equal to the final velocity minus the initial velocity uh, divided by time. And this holds true for constant acceleration problems. Additionally, we have something like, uh, if you remember, we have the average velocity, the average for constant acceleration problems. Again, we have the VF simply minus VI over 2. No, sorry, that's plus VI over 2. Um, and that gives us the average velocity of an object. And also for its position, we like to use um, the letter S it is really simply just the average velocity times the duration or the time. So V of times T. Uh, so you can also sometimes see this written as V F plus V I over two, which is V average here. And then that's all multiplied by T. So hopefully these are pretty straightforward when you see them. I would recommend memorizing them, uh, but not just purely like for what the, the variables are, just think about it, right? Like meters per second times seconds gives you the meters traveled. It's, it's really not that um, strange of a concept, I think, and same with average velocity and acceleration. Um, but you're gonna wanna commit to knowing what these are so you can just whip them out whenever you want. So you'll notice when you look at these that there's really fundamentally like five different variables that we're dealing with. We have VF, where it's like at the velocity at a given time. We have the V naught or the initial, which is initial velocity. We have A, which is acceleration uh, in the vertical direction, that's acceleration due to gravity. And in the horizontal direction, the acceleration is just going to be equal to zero. Uh, we also have T, which is the, the time or duration or an interval, and S, which is the distance traveled. Uh, we can break that down into the, the vertical distance or the horizontal distance with, you know, the, the, by using the letter y or x. Okay, so there are three other equations that you're going to need to know. They are vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2as, s is equal to vit plus 1 half at squared, and vf is equal to vi plus at. So hopefully the first three equations are straightforward enough that you can just remember them pretty easily. And the second three equations, if you can commit them to memory, it's a really good thing to do. You can just bust them out in a test, usually without being questioned by your professor. Um, if your professor is asking you to derive these, um, click the button up here in the top right. I did make a video on deriving these basically from Newton's original laws. Um, so I won't go through that again right now, but you can just click that link and you'll be able to find the derivations. But it's a good thing uh, while you're taking dynamics in school to actually uh, commit these to memory, um, all six of them if you can. Uh, just so you know, these are kind of referred to as the kinematic equations that are going to be popping up all the time throughout the rest of your dynamics course. But at least when we look at them, they're actually all pretty easy. Uh, there's nothing really fancy going on here. Um, 
as long as in the problem that you're given at least three of these five variables, which you will be in a projectile motion problem, you'll be able to find the other two with a, a combination of these. Typically, you'll have to use one to find the first variable, and then you might have to switch equations to find the other unknown. Um, again, sometimes you'll be dealing only in the x direction or only in the y direction, but really you just, you just assess the information that you're given, and then you pick an appropriate formula and you pretty much just plug and chug and uh, it'll spit out the answers really easily and you won't even have to do any calculus um, if you wanted to derive them that requires a little bit of calculus but just using them it's very straightforward so uh, that's kind of it I just that's all I wanted to do is just talk about the general methods so in the next couple of videos when I'm doing examples I can just go ahead and just start using the formulas without getting into too much detail about where they're coming from or, or anything like that. So yeah, I will see you guys in the next couple of videos and we'll be going over a few different examples.